We left off on document 71, and there has been a flurry of documents lately, so we'll pick up from there. I have a second podcast I'm trying to put out today too, so we're going to jump right in. Let's get started. This is Legal Updates with Cassidy, a new grand jury investigation in the never-ending Alex Murdoch case. Welcome. Ever since the document surfaced with the words grand jury investigation, there's been a buzz wondering who this might be for. First, let's talk about why a grand jury investigation is such a big thing. In the justice process, the first steps is for prosecution to collect evidence. When they feel there's enough to bring a case to court, first, it must go to a grand jury. Like regular court, a grand jury case will be heard by a jury. But a grand jury is larger than a regular jury, having from 16 to 23 people. The rules are much more lax, and the person being investigated has less rights for protection of what can be included in evidence, since this is a fact-finding session and not one that will determine guilt or innocence. If the person before the grand jury lies, they can be charged with perjury. Grand juries are not public since the person has not been formally charged, and should the jury not find to indict, their reputations remain clear in the public's eye. Another difference is there is no judge or defense attorney in the room. It's simply prosecution, the accused, and the jury. Unlike a regular trial where evidence can be protected from the jury, a grand jury can issue subpoenas and has broad power to see and hear almost anything the members would like. This, of course, would not apply to any evidence gained improperly. The prosecutor may not lead the jury, but they're there simply to explain the law and also to gather evidence along with the jury. If enough evidence is found for the person to be charged, it will move forward with an indictment then an arraignment, and ultimately a trial. So with this knowledge, we can understand why this news is making waves in the community. This obviously means that the investigation coming from Alex Murdoch's misdeeds is not over, and others are being looked into even now. So with this information in mind, we're going to take a look at document 73, noting that number 72 was a document that had been filled twice by Dick and Jim, so it has been deleted as we see in this docket. Document 73 is an order by Judge Gurgle that was filed on the 28th. We'll see in the summary what it's about, and it introduces the situation that we spoke about in the last podcast. That is, two things, the government's motion to seal certain documents submitted to the court in support of, the second thing, the government's motion to hold defendant in breach of plea agreement. It tells us how the government asserted that the information in the polygraph exam related to an ongoing grand jury investigation as well as allegations of criminal activity against others. Now this sentence stood out to me because it said against others as in plural. So it really makes me wonder if it's more than one person or was it just worded this way. It goes on to say that the sealing of the documents is necessary to protect the integrity of the investigation, prevent disclosure of an ongoing grand jury investigation, and prevent the potential for tampering with evidence and witnesses related to the investigation, and protect the identities of witnesses, subjects, and targets of the ongoing investigation. Notice all plural again. But seeing as the grand jury is kept private and not public, we'll have no way of knowing more about this unless it does come to indictments, which will be made public. It goes on to say that defense opposes, claiming that it was not in compliance with criminal rule 4901 that we covered in the last podcast, and that redaction should be sufficient. We then move on to the factual background portion, and that states that Alex was indicted on May 23rd, 2023. He pled guilty on September 21st, 2023. And then last week, March 26th, 2024, the government moved to be relieved of its obligation under the plea agreement because Alex was in breach of the plea agreement by failing to pass a polygraph exam. It continues saying that the government filed four summaries of interviews with Alex. We know he was interviewed four times, and two of those took place under a polygraph. 
The government filed a report of the polygraph exam, stating that the reason these were conducted is because the government suspected him of not being fully truthful regarding hidden assets. Remember, there's six million dollars missing, and also about another attorney involved in his criminal conduct. And then it repeats that the government moved to seal the polygraph and the witness interviews, saying that public disclosure would undermine this ongoing criminal investigation. It ends by this statement talking about this motion to seal being put on the public docket, and we'll find out why it states this in just a moment. Here under the legal standard, it tells us that courts in this country recognize a general right to inspect and copy public records and documents, including judicial records and documents. But it mentions that this is not absolute, and that certain records may be sealed if it's essential to preserve higher values such as this case, the grand jury involvement. They go on to show their position by citing other court cases that upheld this idea of keeping certain information sealed. And next we find why it was important that there was a public notice. It says before a district court can seal a judicial record, the court must provide public notice of the request to seal, which is satisfied by the filing of a motion to seal on the public docket. Then it notes that the court must consider a less drastic alternative to sealing the documents, such as redaction, if it can be reasonably achieved. Further, if the court elects to seal a document, it must provide specific reasons and factual findings to support the decision to seal and for rejecting the alternatives. Moving on to discussion, it mentions the defense's argument, and we saw this in the last podcast, where Alex's team said that the government did not comply with local criminal rule 4901, and in their opinion, the government had failed to provide sufficient detail regarding why redaction would not be sufficient to which the government had replied that redaction would not sufficiently protect its interest in protecting the integrity of this ongoing criminal investigation. So the court's decision says that after reviewing the summaries of interviews with Alex and the report of Alex's polygraph, it is obvious to the court why the government wishes to seal these documents. That reason being that a detailed explanation sought by the defendant to justify the sealing would result in the very situation the government seeks to avoid, which is publicizing details of the ongoing criminal investigation and that it might undermine the integrity of that investigation or tip off potential targets, again with the plural, that could lead to tampering with evidence or witnesses. So the court finds based on the record before it that it's obvious why the government wants to keep these contents confidential and finds that submission by the government complies with the district's local criminal rule, as we said in our podcast. Now, my regular subs know how much I want to see the judges who helped Alex brought to justice, as well as the judge who is regularly approved of the sale of structured settlements well below their value to an unscrupulous settlement company that has been banned in other states. So this plural targets gives me so much hope that it's beyond a lawyer, but might stretch to these judges. And if you want more detail about those judges, the settlement company was mentioned in the Arthur Badger story. For the record, again, it states that the government has filed the motion and as such proper public notice has been provided. And it repeats again that these details of the ongoing criminal investigation would be revealed by a public filing of these records. And the court itself is hesitant to provide a detailed explanation of its finding because that might disclose the material that they're trying to keep confidential. So they are carefully weighing the public's right to access against the strong public interest in the proper performance of an ongoing criminal investigation and that the balance tips decidedly in favor of keeping nearly all of the substance of the interviews and polygraph report confidential at this time. So what Judge Gergel has decided is that the government could file the four interview summaries and the expert report with redactions, understanding that it may require significant redactions, but still it favors the filing of redacted reports rather than sealing documents, if it is reasonably possible. But they're not asking them to just submit it and file it openly. They want them to file it under seal by 5 o'clock p.m. on March 29th, which was Friday, to protect the integrity and confidentiality of the investigation, if it is reasonably possible. So, they will be there, the court will be able to review them, make sure they're properly redacted, and perhaps then may decide to unseal them. So we'll probably find that out on Monday. 
Next to the point that defense had made that if these documents were to be sealed, then the hearing itself would also need to be sealed, to which the court basically replies, nonsense. Defense claimed it would be essential for him to discuss the content of the documents since the government allegedly relies on these documents to support its motion to hold him in breach of the plea agreement. But the court says this is a complete overstatement. They go on to say that the breach is based on his failure to pass his polygraph examination. Therefore, the only questions, we don't need to get into the content, only questions that the court needs to address regarding the government's motion. One, did the government request defendant to submit a polygraph? We know that they did, and we know also that Alex, in the presence of his lawyers, signed an agreement to do so. Two, was the polygraph examination conducted? We know from the documents in the last podcast that there were four interviews, the first two without polygraph, the second two both with polygraph, so the answer is yes. Did defendant fail to pass the polygraph to the government's satisfaction? We also know that from the documents in last podcast that yes, he failed to pass. Four, if not, has the government exercised its right to declare its obligations under the plea agreement null and void? We know that they have because they did file a motion saying so. So the court continues, beyond establishing these facts, it will not be necessary for defendant to discuss the substance of his interviews with law enforcement officials or anything regarding his polygraph report beyond the issues set forth above. Defendant and his counsel are specifically directed not to discuss any other aspect of the documents in question in addressing the motion to hold defendant in breach of his plea agreement. So, in the hearing coming up tomorrow, Monday morning, Alex's team is being told they may not discuss anything about this polygraph examination other than these four questions. This takes us to document 74. This is a document filed by the government refuting defense's claims about the polygraph fail not being a reason to void the plea agreement and their claims that the polygraph was not carried out appropriately. Again, you'll find that document they're referring to in the last podcast. The points they mention as relevant is that Alex and his attorney both signed this plea agreement. In it, Alex agreed to submit to a polygraph examination as may be requested by the government and that this examination would be performed by a polygraph examiner selected by the government. And most importantly, he agreed that his failure to pass a polygraph to the government's satisfaction will result in the government's sole discretion in the obligations of the government within the agreement becoming null and void. And this wording is exactly what Alex agreed to. He was a lawyer himself, represented by other lawyers. They all read this document. They all signed it. It goes on to say this plea agreement is plain and unambiguous. The question before the court is not whether the polygraph examiner has enough experience, whether he asked good questions, because remember they, they questioned the type of questions that were asked, the manner in which they were asked. But they're saying this is not important, that the only important things are one, did the government request defendant to submit a polygraph? Yes. Was the polygraph examination conducted? Yes. Did defendant fail to pass the polygraph to the government satisfaction? Yes. And if not, has the government exercised its right to declare its obligations under the plea agreement null and void? And as they say, the answer to each question is yes. And then let's direct down to the footnote where it shows the legal precedent regarding plea agreements based on polygraph passing. And it shows that the Fourth Circuit has upheld this plea agreement provision for decades. This is not something new with Alex. This was not something to trick Alex or trip him up. This has been established for decades. And what has been established? That the failure to pass a polygraph exam to the government's satisfaction is a breach of the plea agreement. And it goes on to cite multiple cases that prove this is legal precedent. It goes on to say that Alex tried to escape the consequences of the agreement that he knowingly and voluntarily entered into. He also made claims that the government had acted in bad faith. Then they cite legal precedent that the Fourth Circuit has held that where a plea agreement contemplates that the government will file a substantial assistance downward departure motion if the defendant provides truthful cooperation, that it falls to the government and not the district court as the appropriate party to assess whether the defendant has performed that condition adequately. So basically saying this is not a decision to be made by the court, but in the Fourth Circuit, it's upheld that this is up to the government to decide. 
And again, they cite some cases about that. And then in the footnote, we see where it says the government believes the polygraph report is sufficient to prove that breach by a preponderance of evidence. Nevertheless, the government is prepared to call the polygrapher at sentencing should the court deem it necessary to resolve the government's motion. I'd kind of like to see that, to be honest. It goes on to say that they feel that they have satisfied their burden in setting forth a good faith reason for moving to hold Murdaugh in breach of his plea agreement. And also mentioned, it wasn't just once, but Murdaugh failed two separate series on two separate issues in his polygraph examination. So in their document, they had tried to make it as though the questions had surprised him and he didn't understand the meaning of hidden assets and that that's why he had the reaction that he did. But he wasn't asked about this one time. He'd already been asked about it in the previous interviews. They felt he was lying. Then he was asked again two more times and those times with the polygraph. And it's interesting, he obviously passed every other part. It's only these two specific points. So two specific points he failed on two separate occasions after having been interviewed previously without a polygraph, and they felt in those cases he wasn't being honest. So they're saying that he has not made a showing, much less a substantial showing, that the government has acted in bad faith. So basically, they put that accusation out there, but they didn't back it up with the evidence. Instead, they relied on an isolated press statement where the government said that they wanted to ensure that he's never a free man again. They're saying that in itself is not evidence of acting in bad faith and that therefore Alex should not be able to escape the bargain for consequences of his failure to be fully truthful. Then they move on to the point of him attacking the reliability of the polygraph and that he said the court should not rely on the polygraph results as evidence of truthfulness. They say the government is asking the court to find Murdoch did not pass the polygraph exam to the government's satisfaction and he therefore breached his plea agreement. Another thing that they claimed is that this was robbing Alex of his Sixth Amendment right, and that would mean that he would have a right to cross-examine the polygrapher. The government says that this is a misrepresentation of what the Sixth Amendment right guarantees, that it does not apply to breach of plea hearings. But rather, the Supreme Court carefully describes confrontation rights as protecting accused defendants during the determination of their guilt or innocence. So this applies during the initial trial, not a plea hearing, and that once the accused has been properly convicted, the purposes of the proceeding and the evidentiary rules governing it change. The confrontational clause does not apply at sentencing or during supervised release revocation proceedings because those proceedings are not meant to determine guilt or innocence. Neither is the breach of a plea proceeding. So their conclusion is that Murdaugh agreed to submit to a polygraph exam performed by an examiner of the government's choosing. And this docket 37 would be the plea agreement. He agreed that his failure to pass a polygraph to the government's satisfaction would result at the government's sole discretion in the government's obligations under the agreement becoming null and void. Murdaugh failed to pass the polygraph to the government's satisfaction and the government asked the court to relieve it of its obligations under the agreement, respectfully submitted, the United States Attorney. Document 75 is sealed, so that's most likely the redacted document that the court ordered due on Friday. And that brings us to document 76, our last one today. This is a motion to compel, where Dick is demanding copies of the polygraph examination documentation. Of course, it's dramatically worded, saying the government argues that standard contract law ought to apply to the motion and to Mr. Murdoch's plea agreement, and that application of that law to his agreement should give the government the unfettered ability, see what I mean dramatically, they didn't ask for unfettered ability, to arbitrarily declare that Mr. Murdaugh has violated the agreement, but the government overlooks the plea agreements contain a duty of good faith and fair dealing. They go on to say that this polygraph was plagued by many irregularities and violated in material respects the standards for designing appropriate polygraph questions. Again, my question, he's asking for this evidence now. That means he doesn't have it. So how does he know about these irregularities and violations? 
He goes on to say, for these reasons, the government should not be permitted to rely on the results of that polygraph examination in the first instance. However, if the court intends to entertain the government's position, Mr. Murdoch should be afforded the opportunity to fully explore the data and information underlying the examination, as he carries the burden to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the government has violated the duty of good faith and fair dealing. So he then asked for any digital or computerized files generated by the polygraph machine for Mr. Murdoch's examination, sometimes referred to as PF files. Any audio or video recording of the polygraph examination that may have been created, any summaries, scripts, notes, or other documents created or used by the polygraph examiner for Mr. Murdoch's examination. And then they note that these PF files are generated by a polygraph machine and they contain hard data about what the machine recorded during the examination. And that data often contradict the examiner's manual scoring of the polygraph charts. And given the sensitivity of these machines, things like the polygraph operator's tone of voice or even extraneous voices can have impact on the test results. All of this information is thus relevant and provides context to the government's conduct in relation to Mr. Murdoch's plea agreement. And there is simply no reason why the government should not be compelled to provide this information in light of the position taken in its motion. So we can surely expect that they're going to find some marvelous expert out there, like the one who described Paul's shooter as five foot two, to say that this polygraph examination result is false. And they ask again that the government be compelled to produce the above identified documents and information which are relevant to the government's pending motion to hold defendant in breach of plea agreement. So that catches us up with all of the documents filed so far. As I mentioned earlier, the hearing is still scheduled for Monday morning at 10, where I presume it will begin with the court's decision on whether or not Alex voided his plea argument, since that finding will determine whether or not his sentence will run consecutively or concurrently, and whether or not there will be an upward variance on his sentence. I unfortunately will not be able to make the hearing this time, but I'll be checking in with those who can, and will try my best to get the information to you as soon as possible. Till then, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned.